Good morning, good day, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, which is going to be about battery buffered magnetic absolute encoders. I'm joined today by Mr. Patrick Stahl and Mr. Joachim Kvastorf. And just in terms of preparation for today, we will have two sessions uh, and we will have a five minutes comfort break in between. So you will have time to take a coffee and, and do other things. So it's just important for you to know that you should be back uh, after five minutes after we have done the the break and then the second uh, presentation will start. So without further notice, I just want to make sure that you get familiarized with the webinar tool. So um, in terms of features, you have a control panel and on this one you can open and close the control panel and then there's a question field where you can ask your questions and your questions will be forwarded to the webinar team here and then they will send it on to me so I can ask uh, the, the presentations and answer the questions uh, from the team here. So we would like to encourage you to ask questions. Uh, on the last webinar, uh, there were quite a few questions and we had to respond to them afterwards. Today, if there are many questions, we will continue to record and answer as many questions as we can. And should not all questions be answered, we will always uh, come back to you afterwards and respond to your questions individually. So without further notice, just moving on to the screens. Um, you have two uh, screens here, one for the speaker and one for the presentation. And you can size up and down, and there's a function in the middle here where you can scroll up and down to decide which uh, screen you want to see in a, a larger picture. Uh, please be aware of that don't go all the way up or all the way down, because then you will lose one of the screens. So just be ca cautious when you scroll up and down and make sure you adjust it for the needs you have. So without further notice, I would like to pass on the word to Patrick Stahl, who's going to start the presentation. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much, Henrik. Yeah, hello and welcome, everyone. Good to have you here. My name is Patrick Stahl, and at IC House, I'm responsible for sales and application of encoder ICs and microsystems. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about our new ICPVS battery buffered magnetic absolute encoder. Let's have a quick look at our agenda today. Uh, we have two parts in this webinar. In part one, I will basically introduce ICPVS to you and talk you through its uh, features and applications. I will also do a live demonstration of the setup, um, show you how to set up everything to uh, scan a magnetic incremental target or a gear wheel with the help of a back bias magnet. We will also do an accuracy measurement of this setup. Afterwards, I'll take some time uh, to answer any questions that uh, might have come up. Okay, so let's get started. So what is the ICPVS? Well, in a nutshell, it is our well-known ICPVL, Battery Buffered Multi-Turn Encoder IC, combined with a configurable Hall line that can be used for scanning uh, off-axis or linear targets. This comes together with differential sine cosine output that provide the analog signals of this Hall sensor line. We then added our well-known BIS interface, threw in an SPI interface, added some features, and there we arrived at the ICPVS. Let's have a look at the block diagram here showing the core features of ICPVS. So the chip is designed for uh, operating voltage of typically 3.3 uh, to 5 volts and comes in a 38 pin QFN 5 by 7 millimeter housing. At the VBAT pin, it's uh, possible to connect a battery uh, as a backup power source. Um, the battery current is adjustable uh, depending on the application and typically lies in the range of 2 to 30 microamps. As you can see on the block diagram here, there's a supply monitor. Uh, this supply monitor will switch back and forth in between battery supply and VDD supply depending on the voltage level here at VDD. So if this voltage drops below a certain threshold, this supply monitor will automatically switch to battery supply. If it rises above a certain threshold, it will automatically switch back to VDD supply. Please note that current is only drawn from the battery when the supply monitor has switched to battery supply. That means there's not sufficient voltage available at the VDD pin. Then the ICPVS has an internal battery buffered 56-bit position counter. 
that holds multi-turn and period counter information and also incorporates an adjustable flex count engine that allows you to interpret any number of magnetic input periods from 1 to 65,536 um, as one mechanical uh, revolution. The most prominent feature of ICPVS is the configurable hall sensor line. Um, this can be configured to accommodate a pole uh, width between 0.5 and 2.5 millimeters or also gear tooth module from 0.3 to 1.5 millimeters. It uh, comes with differential scanning. That means it is very robust against any external magnetic stray fields. Also, there's an automatic gain control which ensures that the hall sensor amplification is always within the optimal range. And additionally, it's possible to remove any offset or amplitude errors from the analog signal. On this side here, you see the differential sine cosine outputs that um, provide these analog sine cosine signals, uh, for example, for further downstream interpolation. Then we have a 6-bit interpolator that also receives this analog sine cosine signal and allows you um, to uh, uh, output a interpolated position word at the user interfaces of ICPVS. As user interfaces, we have our BIS interface, an SBI interface, SSI interface, and also a multi-master I2C interface which also allows to connect an external app APROM that can um, hold the device configuration. And last but not least, we have four GPIO ports that can be configured at either inputs or outputs. When you configure them as an input, it's possible to assign commands to these GPIO pins that can then be triggered by toggling the respective pin. When configured as outputs, amongst other things, you can output incremental ABZ signals with a resolution up to 64 increments per pole pair. Let's have a look at the differences in between PVL and PVS. So the ICPVS uh, comes in a much larger uh, QFN 38 by 5, 5 by 7 millimeter housing. This is due to the internal hall sensor line that just requires some space. It is suitable for linear or off-axis scanning, so you cannot use it for on-axis scanning of a diametrical magnet. The maximum input frequency is much higher, 25 kHz, and the internal interpolator yields 6 instead of 3-bit resolution. As already said before, you have a differential sine-cosine output that, um, that gives you the uh, sine-cosine signals of the configurable hall array. In addition to the SSI and I2C interface, um, ICPVS also features a BIS and an SPI interface. And the battery monitor and the system diagnostics have been updated with additional features and functionality. In order to understand how ICPVS works, it's very important to understand the principle of battery buffered period counting. So in this example here, we have ICPVS scanning a simple incremental target um, that doesn't contain any absolute position information at all. In fact, it could be a gear wheel. Um, so to derive an absolute position out of this, um, basically we need to count the current period that is scanned by ICPVS at all time. So ICPVS uh, achieves this with an internal period counter engine. When the chip is powered up, which usually means you connect the battery and connect VDD, this counter is then initialized here with a value of zero. And then if the target spins clockwise or counterclockwise, ICPVS counts the number of poles that passed the sensor. So let's assume the system started up at zero here, and then the target turned counterclockwise by 16 magnetic pole pairs. So that means your period counter here will sit at a value of 16 now. In addition, I have mentioned earlier on, there's an internal flex count engine that allows to configure any number of magnetic input periods as one mechanical uh, revolution. So in this case, we have 32 magnetic input periods 
That means if that number is reached, this multi-turn counter is incremented or decremented depending on the, the direction of rotation. It's very important to understand that this will also work if the power supply is removed from ICPVS. ICPVS will automatically switch to battery supply in that case and keep track of the multi-turn count and the period count at all times. Once the VDD supply is available again, you can immediately output a course position represented by these two values here. This can then be supplemented by an interpolated 6-bit position word, which basically gives you 64 positions within one magnetic period. Let's have a look at an example here. Um, so let's assume we have a 32 pole per magnetic target, um, like that one that is shown here in the picture. So your period counter can basically distinguish 5 bit of information or 32 position words. Um, that is clear because this target here has 32 magnetic periods that can be counted by ICPVS. This information can then be supplemented with a further 6 bit of information, which means 64 position words within one magnetic period of this target. So in total, you'll get a single turn position word then of 11 bit. And this can then be um, amended by a multi-turn value up to 48 bit. And this basically then in the end is uh, your absolute position word that can be output by the ICPVS. Let's have a look again at the position data um, that is provided by ICPVS and summarize. So on one hand, you of course you have the absolute position that is available via the serial user interfaces of ICPVS. And then you have the differential sine cosine signal, which represents the position within one magnetic period and is available at the differential analog sine cosine output. So keep this in mind because this is important in order to understand how ICPVS can be used with interpolators like the ICTW29. Okay, so I have talked a lot about the ICPVS here now with my slides. I've prepared a live demonstration for you and um, I move over to the caddy and show you basically what we see here in our setup. So first of all, you can see that we have two ICPVS PVS1M evaluation boards here that host the ICPVS chip. One of these boards is scanning a simple magnetic incremental target here, and this board is then connected via the blue ribbon cable. The other board here is scanning a gear wheel with the help of a back bias magnet that is behind the board here. You will not be able to really see this, but you just got to believe me that it's there. And this board then is connected with the red ribbon cable here. You see we have created a little special setup here containing uh, or compromising of a of a gear wheel and a magnetic cold disk glued together. It's not really a real world setup, but we just wanted to show you both applications here in one setup. Everything is mounted on a motor here. And this motor also contains an optical reference encoder, a BIS reference encoder, so that we can do our accuracy measurement later on. The PVS1M boards are then connected to the PVS1D breakout board. This board basically allows easy access to all the signals of the ICPVS. You can connect uh, your BIS adapters here and you have the possibility um, to have a backup battery installed. Uh, as you see in that case, this is empty here because we don't need it because there's a little super cap here on the, on the PVS warm m board that holds enough charge for a couple of days, which is perfectly fine for our demo here. Everything is connected via this cable. A power is provided here and the BIS bus provided. This cable runs um, to the back here to a connector board. And this connector board basically creates a BIS chain of the BIS reference encoder that is in the motor and the PVS here. And then you can see our uh, MB5U um, BIS adapter, which basically connects via USB to the computer screen or to the computer here and uh, where the GUI is running. So now I will uh, switch over so that you can see um, the GUI. OK. 
Okay, so hopefully this worked. Okay, now I need to remove this here. All right. Okay, so here uh, on the screen now you're able to see our ICPDS GUI that allows you uh, to configure the chip. Let's connect to the ICPDS board. So you see the connection has been established now. And now um, remember we are using uh, here with a blue cable the PDS that is scanning the incremental magnetic target here. I just talked you through some of the most important settings here. So I have set the revolution counter here to 16-bit. You could set that to any other value too, but 16-bit is just practical for now. The period count per revolution uh, is set to 32. This is because the magnetic code disk that we're using here has 32 magnetic periods. So here we're telling PVS that 32 magnetic periods are one full mechanical uh, revolution so that the, the multi-turn count is correct. We also put the, the period count in our um, serial data stream here. And the internal uh, interpolator is set to a bit length of 6, so you interpolate with a 6-bit resolution in that case. We're using the BIS interface here. And then if I switch over to the magnet tab, I have set the pole size of the, of the magnetic, uh, of the Hall sensor line to 1.5 millimeter differential scanning, which is suitable for that target here. And now you can see when I read the sensor and I move this target here, the position is uh, nicely tracked. So here you can see the period count, you see the interpolated value, and this is the multi-turn count here. So you see this also rolls over. So remember this multi-turn count is at 1000 now. I basically disconnect everything now and I remove my power from the board. So there's no power available on the board now. And now I make one full rotation of the setup here. Connect everything up again. Connect my GUI. And now when I read the sensor again, you see that value has changed uh, to 1001. So that means uh, PBS has tracked this position perfectly fine, even without any power connected. Okay, now I'll switch over and show you our gear wheel setup. I'm connecting the red ribbon cable here. You can see this. And I'm connecting here to the setup again and uh, talk you through the most important settings again. We leave the revolution counter length at 16-bit. We have to update the period counts per revolution to 80 because this uh, specific gear wheel here has 80 teeth. So 80 teeth make up one full rotation. So we're telling PVS this here. PCR output mode states active. 6-bit interpolation. We stay on the BIS interface. And now we have to change here the magnetic pole size to 1.75 millimeter, which is suitable here for scanning this gear wheel with a module of one. And now I can read my sensor again, and you see we get a period count, interpolated value here in multi-turn. I can turn this a bit here, and you see the values basically nicely updating here. And I can do the same thing that I did before. Um, I remove the power from the system, unplug everything, and then I'll make a full rotation here with my gear wheel. And if I power everything up again, connect the setup, I read the sensor position, and now you see the, the multi-turn counter or the revolution counter is updated to 1002 in that case. So also here, the position is uh, constantly tracked, even without power. Let's do an accuracy measurement of this setup. For this, basically, I use our uh, BIS reader software, which is configured uh, to read the position data of our reference encoder here in data channel 2. Data channel 1 is our PVS encoder. I connect the setup here. And if I read the data, you can see that I get two position words. One position word is from PVS, and the other position word is from the reference encoder. You see that here in the single turn fields, and if I move this, this position updates. It's fully synchronized because we're using our BIS interface. 
And now I can bring up the accuracy tool, which is part of our BIS reader, start up our motor, and do an accuracy measurement here. And here now you basically see the accuracy, absolute accuracy cor curve over 360 degree mechanical. So keep this value here in mind. Um, the, the absolute accuracy of this coarse mechanical setup, so there's no signal correction or whatsoever used, is plus minus 0.2 degree. Um, my colleague Joachim Kwastov will show you later on what is possible when you use an interpolator like ICTW29. Okay, so this concludes my uh, live presentation here. And uh, I hope this was very interesting for you. I got two more slides for you that I want to show you and summarize everything. Okay. All right. So what are the unique selling propositions of the ICPDS? Well, you can create absolute rotary multi-turn or linear encoders from a wide variety of magnetic incremental scales or Fierro's gear wheels or racks with the help of a back bias magnet. The diameter of the systems or the absolute measurement length is freely scalable. Um, the, the, the pole pitch, as I mentioned earlier, or the gear tooth module can be configured. There's an internal battery buffered 56-bit position counter that keeps track of the period count and the multi-turn count at all times, even when no power is available. And we have uh, numerous diagnostic features in this PVS that ensure the system integrity at all time. What does that mean? Well, basically, if anything happens that could impact the validity of your absolute position, this is immediately flagged and reported to the user, so it's a very safe system. This makes uh, ICPVS absolutely ideal for all kind of rev revolution counting, so multi-turn applications, general metering applications. Um, you can create an absolute encoder from a wide variety of incremental or rotary scales or gear wheels, but you could also choose it just to use it as a configurable analog sine cosine front end as well. What system options do we have? Well, the first system options obviously is uh, to use ICPVS as a standalone system. There you can use the internal 6-bit interpolator to create a relatively low resolution absolute encoder system and output this um, position data then via the serial absolute data interface. In parallel, there's an incremental interface available with up to 64 increments per magnetic pole pair and you have the differential analog sine cosine interface. For application that require a higher performance in terms of absolute uh, accuracy and also the resolution, of course, you can combine ICPVS with an interpolator, especially with ICTW29 in that case. So ICTW29 has an absolute data or ADI interface that can um, receive the absolute position information from PVS. In parallel, you can connect the differential sine cosine signal. The ICTW29 will then apply sophisticated position error and signal error correction to the sine cosine signal and combine this um, absolute position word with the interpolated position derived from the sine cosine information. So in the end, you'll have a high resolution position word that can be output also via BIS, SSI, SPI, you have the incremental AD set interface. And keep in mind, um, we're talking about a 26-bit encoder processor here, so you can really build very high resolution systems with that. All right, so thank you very much, everyone. That concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I think we'll just take a short time here for a quick poll, and then you can please uh, take some time just to answer these questions, and then after a minute, we will then uh, start again with questions and answers. So thank you for taking time to uh, answer to our polling. So just show you the results. So as you can see here, um, the rotary scanning of magnetic codisks is the main topic that is interesting to you, but it's also a fair 
bit of um, respondents saying that uh, rotary scanning of gear wheel and the linear scanning of magnetic tape is also of interest. So thank you very much for taking the time. And um, I've got quite a few questions. So Patrick, we will have to work through these ones. And uh, I'll start with the first question, which yes. is uh, if battery has to be switched, how does that affect the absolute zero changes? I'm not sure 100% uh, understand this. Well, if you mean if you have to, main, uh, to service the system, basically, you have to understand with a battery buffered system, as soon as you remove all the power, your position is lost, of course. But you could choose to power the system via VDD and then change the battery. That means your position in that case will not be lost. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is, does the ICPVS still count if the magnetic disk is moved while the ICPVS is just powered by the battery buffer? Of course, yes. Uh, that, this is uh, the basic principle here. Um, if, the, if the IC is only powered by the battery, it will always keep track of the period and the multi-turn count at all times, which makes it an absolute encoder, really. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question, is there a difference in accuracy between magnetic target and gear target with bias magnetic? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. I, I think it really comes down to the accuracy then of your, your code disk or your gear wheel. And also a very important factor, obviously, is your scanning diameter. That means uh, for smaller scanning diameter, any eccentricity that you have on the target um, um, plays a bigger bigger role here and um, and then of course also you know how how precisely these targets are manufactured and the whole mechanical setup of the encoder is basically the dominating factor in the accuracy okay thank you patrick mm -hmm. next question is is there a data sheet available there is a data sheet available as a preliminary version at the moment, but um, keep in mind um, this IC is not on our webpage yet, and we plan to launch it in quarter three this year. This is also when all the official documentation will become available. But if you have any questions, please always feel free to contact me, write me an email, give me a phone call, and we can talk through your application. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. I'll continue with the next question. Yes. So, um, is the mechanical tolerance decreasing when using a gear target plus bias magnet? The mechanical tolerance decreasing. Um, I guess no. I mean, uh, if uh, w whatever target you use, uh, if it's an incremental magnetic target or a gear wheel, um, it's always important to have a precise mechanical setup because any mechanical errors in your system will influence the absolute accuracy of the system. Maybe with a gear wheel, could be even less critical because usually they can be quite large in diameter. Okay, thank you. The next question, uh, do you have some more information about the super cap for supply the sensor board for some, some days? What capacity does it have? Perhaps a sample schematic or any other info? about this well you can you can contact me for that i mean there are a lot of super caps out there on the market with different capacities and it really depends on your specific application what super cap uh, fits best okay good um i'll move on to another question here are are the samples available for easy pvs it can be sent to customers. Okay, I said uh, earlier before, I said uh, it's, become, it's uh, going to be available, the chip, in the uh, course of the quarter three this year. Um, we can do individual sampling on a case-to-case -case basis with uh, select customers. Um, you, you need to uh, contact me personally to discuss this. Okay, mm -hmm. time for another one as well. Would it also be possible to combine the ICPVS with a linear gear rack to achieve a linear encoder similar to the ICPZ205? Well, uh, as I said earlier, yes, you can scan a gear rack too with the help of a back bias magnet. So it's possible. It will be an absolute encoder, of course, if you provide a battery backup. Uh, in terms of, you know, the system performance and resolution, um, we would have to take a look at that. Um, definitely, if you could combine the PVS with the TW29 interpolator, uh, you can uh, create a fairly high-resolution system of that. Okay, thank you. 
We continue with the questions. It's very good that you ask a, a lot of questions, so yes. we'll try to move on here. If no power is available, no VDD, uh, nor no VBAT, and the power is on, what errors does the device indicate? Well, uh, you said if, if no power is available, of course, then uh, the device at the moment doesn't provide anything because there's no power. But let's assume you have a VDD connected with a power, but you don't have the battery connected or the battery voltage is low, then you definitely can configure that the device sets battery warnings and battery errors in that case. Um, you will also be able, if the device at any point in time had a reset, this will also be uh, latched and flagged in that case. And um, please also keep in mind um, with the ICPVS, you cannot leave the battery pin open. So you always need to make sure that something is, con or that the VDD supply is connected to the, to the VBAT pin if you're using it without a battery, which is possible, but just not leave the pin open. This is not allowed. Okay, moving on. Yeah. What does the current consumption depend on? Um, I assume that you refer to the battery current, and this really depends on the maximum acceleration that you um, expect in your encoder system. Um, and this value can be configured with a parameter in ICPVS. And um, typically for large systems with a big inertia, uh, this is uh, pretty low resolutions. And if you have a very small system, this value needs to be set higher to accommodate really fast um, uh, accelerations. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Two more. Two more, <laughs> um, all yes. right. Okay, what is the maximum number of pole pairs per revolution that can be set in the sensor? Um, yes, so the, the internal, the PCR count, um, I think can be set up to, uh, I would have really to look at the specification again, but I think it's in the range of 40 bit. Okay, the last question, um, yes. is the maximum input speed the same in the battery mode and the normal one, normal mode? Uh, the maximum input? Yeah, speed. Um, yes, yes, it's the same, definitely. Okay, so I appreciate all the questions, and, and just let me reiterate, if you want to ask questions again to Patrick, we will take them and answer to you either after uh, the next session or uh, directly to you via email. And that concludes the first section of this uh, presentation today. We will now take a five minutes break, and please be back in five minutes' time, then we'll start again. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you for being back on time. And without further notice, I will just pass on the word to our next presenter, which is Mr. Joachim Kvassdorf. Joachim, please go ahead. Okay, so it's my pleasure to take over part two. Um, my name is Joachim Kvassdorf, and I'm responsible for sales and application development for optical encoders and magnetic encoders. Uh, interpolation ICs are my specialty, and so I'll take over part two, which is about the new ICTW29 encoder processor. I will cover a few aspects of an industrial sensor system before switching to the core functions of TW29 you may need to implement sensor sided. I will explain the block functions with a key focus on, on the functions that you need to interface the ICPVS. Um, finally, I will be repeating a live demonstration, um, the accuracy measurement, now using the TW29 in between. First, let's take a look at a typical industrial sensor system. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our sensor, our device as a transceiver, which is talking to the transmission channel, that is usually a cable, which is then connected to a receiver, that is our PLC here also providing the power to the application. Um, taking a deeper look at the single converter uh, and the tasks uh, you require to assign here. First of all, uh, signal conditioning and error correction. That's clearly a must to do, if not already the sensor provides you conditioned signals. Maybe also temperature drift compensation may need to be considered. It depends on the sensor. Compensation of misalignment, 
Well, if you think of a modular device where the end customer is mounting the read head to the target, it's not just a nice to have function. If there can be an automatic error correction, it will save you time and money. Uh, signal monitoring, maybe I should say operational monitoring of the sensor device. That's clearly a must do, it must be done anyway. And this time, since we are not going to transmit analog signals, we cannot pass on this task to the external PLC anymore. Well, going out with the digital world means that we have some more tasks on top, such as resolution enhancement by interpolation, digital filtering and data processing, until we have prepared the most accurate position data we output over a digital interface, such as a BIS interface. A bright word on, on interpolation, what does it mean? I'm sure you will be familiar with analog to digital converters. Uh, those are converting the applied input voltage to a linear value. The sine, and co sine to cosine digital converter does more or less the same, just its core functions is a nonlinear uh, transmission of the input as input is sine cosine. So the digitized word, what we get, is a phase angle in this case. The principles we are using for this core engine here, there are different ones we implemented, and I don't want to go into the detail. It can guide you to a white paper on our website. It covers uh, several concepts. Um, let me guide you briefly through our interpolator portfolio. We start at devices doing 6-bit resolutions and end with currently 16 plus bits. So CTW29 is the end of the line here. But please keep in mind that accuracy is not the same as resolution. You see it here, 8-bit resolution, 4.2 accuracy, that is close to a 6-bit accuracy. And the best INR we specify is at 0.1 degree per electrical input cycle. Now this means around a 12-bit resolution. Now, from the TW series, you may be already familiar with the push button automatic function, and this comes along with TW29 as well. But on top of that, you can get uh, eccentricity correction. So this is a compensation of the long wave uh, angle error that comes along with rotary applications. Um, for this portfolio, what I marked here in those boxes, most of these devices are traditional interpolators which output uh, incremental uh, ABZ quadrature signals. Not quite so, the TW29. Uh, due to its absolute data interface, it can be initialized for the input line it is operating on, and so it can uh, calculate from this a uh, angle value which is over 360 degrees absolute. This makes it ideal to open the, open the application uh, up to absolute systems. Well, I'm coming to the sensors. It's not all about whole sensors out there. So there are magnetoresistive sensors uh, known, the AMR sensor and the TMR sensor, which provides two or two, one input cycle per turn if those are mounted on axis, as shown in this image here. If you go off axis, um, for instance here, we may have to deal with higher line counts. In, in case of linear applications, it could be an almost unlimited number. For the application I'm going to discuss here, the magnetic gear wheel encoder, well, we may get up to 256 CPR, otherwise the gear wheels will be quite large. And it doesn't play a role if you scan it with a GMR sensor, which is operated with back bias magnet, or if you are using the PVS here. Um, the limitation of the gear uh, tooth count is uh, almost the same. Now, when we come to optical sensors, we have to deal with 10 times the line count and 10 times the input frequency. You see, um, the word is changing. The word of those sensors is quite diverse, but I can keep it quite short. The ICTW29 has the flexibility to take on anything. It 
the engine accepts input levels from 30 millivolts up to 2 volts, frequencies up to two, uh, 700 kilohertz, and for rotary applications, the line count is limited to 12 bits, so 4096 cycles per revolution. Um, you see that we have also an offset level shifter here for sensors which coming out of the 5 volt world. Those provide uh, sine cosine with an offset of 2.5 volts, and we have an embedded level shifter uh, which reduces this input voltage uh, to, to make it suitable for our 3 volt device. As the image also explains here, there is another interface, the absolute data interface. I'm going to use this interface PVS, and this can be configured uh, for BIS and SSI. On the right-hand side, uh, we have all the output, uh, output interfaces we can use. There is a differential RS-42 output driver to supply quadrature signals. You can have ABZ uh, quadrature signals along with UVW for commutation. And for absolute data, there is a BIS interface available and the SPI interface. The SPI is, oper is always active in parallel. You can use both at a time. Now I'm getting back to the core functions. Uh, in a summary, I can say the engine does everything what is required to interface the sensor, to condition the signals, to correct uh, the signal errors, to, to cater for misalignment things and everything, and also signal monitoring, what is most important. We need to detect if a bond wire is gone, and this is uh, detected here. And for the outgoing uh, digitized position, we do everything what is required to generate the most accurate uh, output data. Um, a brief look at the block diagram. The analog front end uh, is the section which uh, takes the input signals and condition it with a coarse gain and also coarse offset so that the subsequent delta sigma ADCs can be fed with an almost um, full-scale uh, signal. From here is also a computation of the interpolated angle, which is then passed on to a gearbox. <laughs> you may wonder, what the hell is a gearbox inside an IC? Well, uh, no worries, I'll explain it in a second, but let me finalize this one here. Um, we get flexible I.O. Port, I.O. stages, six, uh, six in total, and I'm going to use to occupy those for the BIS interface and also for the ADI interface. Now back to the gearbox. Um, well, like the transmission in your car, I'm assuming it's a manual transmission, um, it does the input to output scaling. First, for a traditional interpolator, you would uh, resolve one input cycle, let's say by 13 bits, what means eight, 81, 92 angle steps. So this is for a traditional interpolator. Um, for the TW29, we have the flexibility to teach this engine with the input line count. For instance, entering here 80, and if I then would, would configure 16 bits output resolution, this would mean that the engine is running at a weird interpolation factor of 819.2. Actually, we can do any arbitrary number. It does not need a decimal or binary value. And uh, we can also scale down. If we know an absolute value, we can output any, uh, any lower line count. It doesn't depend on the input anymore. Now, how are we going to interface the PVS? As you have seen, it, uh, the PVS provides you a multi-turn count and a period count and also a six-bit interpolated angle. So this information is passed on to the ADI interface and to be evaluated by TW29. And the sine and cosine, which is evaluated by the PVS, so this interpolator is also connected to the interpolator of TW29 so we get an overlapping information. This is visible here. I call it synchronization information. So how to deal with this? Um, I'm going into the detail. That is the word the PVS is providing you, the RC, the revolution count of 16 bits, a period count with one byte, and a six-bit value for the interpolator. Actually, the job is now we must 
have an input data which fits to our uh, gearbox design, or we must scale it or uh, condition it slice by slice to fit to the internal engine. And that's a task of, of some gap bits we have to, to, uh, to dump uh, uh, information which is too much. For this byte of the period counter, well, if I uh, need to evaluate 80 lines, I don't need uh, 8 bits. 7 bits uh, are counting up to 128, so we need to dump 1 bit. That is visible here. And also in my screen takes, the CC gap bit is defined by 1. It, we are dumping 1 uh, single bit. Same more or less for the interpolator here. We are getting 6 bits from PBS, whereas the TW29 can use a maximum of 4 bits for synchronization. So we need to dump two bits, and that's the task of the S-gap here, uh, dumping two. If we've done this uh, correctly, we are also moving the error and warning bits to a position where it can be evaluated by the uh, status registers of the TW29. Our GUI is uh, kind of intuitive, and it's quite easy if you press on, if you click on one of those boxes, you will or get, uh, get, uh, get a table opened uh, um, presenting all the parameters which are related to this uh, module. Um, we decided to ease your setting up operation and offer a predefined application settings for optical encoders and magnetic encoders, which you can simply load in uh, to get you started much faster and easier. I'm now coming back uh, to a presentation uh, on the Caddy. I'm using a, another eval board, uh, which is not yet available for sales. It's a 4D. Uh, it eases my connection of the input signals as it features a 10 pin uh, well connectors for all the input signals. Okay, so I'm going to the demo setup. Um, I disconnected the BIS cable and now um, I'm installing the PV, uh, sorry, as a TW29 board in between. Very easy to connect the sine cosine signals and of the data output of PVS, I'm connecting my absolute data interface. And finally, BIS host goes on the output of TW29. That's for the setup. Um, I'm now preparing the screen so that you can see my screen. Okay, that's the GUI. Initially, I connect to DW29, and as I, I'm connecting a new sensor, I did not yet condition my input signals. And there's a nice window called Visualizer Window, what shows you, uh, shows you the input sine cosine signals, and we can easily see that we're not meeting the green circle. I power on my drive to get a little speed here. And now it's a very simple thing to press on the calibration button. I do this, press. And you now see that the circle gets, circ uh, that the income put signals uh, gets aligned to the green target. And also here for eccentricity, the engine tries to settle the eccentricity correction. This is possible if the speed is almost very constant. Uh, usually it needs a higher speed to do this. We will see this. Okay, I stop here and disconnect it. I'm not saving yet my uh, condition parameters. We can do it again on push of a button. Um, I'm now going to the BIS GUI that you have seen and connect again. Um, Let's see if it's already working. Yes, I, I have it configured. And I'm going again to the accuracy tool and starting the measurement. Okay, that does not work. I need to scale this first. Oh, it's set up. Okay. Um, first of all, we can easily see that the resolution is much, much higher uh, in fact, um, I'm here running at 23 bit per single turn, 
what means if you compare it to the 13 bits we have seen before, we have 10 more bits on top, what means that the LSB is much, much finer. What survives certainly is a long wave position error. And that is something what I can try to compensate by the eccentricity correction. I'm now pressing again the calibration button. And at the same time, I'm hiring my speed to get a faster, faster settling here. OK, I assume it's done. Uh, I'd like to get rid of the noise, going for lower speeds. You see the measurement is still running. And uh, here, this measure, uh, this range now tells me I'm in a range of 0 0.02 something. So if you remember the 0 0.2 degrees uh, we had before, so we have about 10 times in accuracy. OK. That was it for the demonstration. I got a final slide for you. Um, I'm summarizing the uh, system features you can expect from the setup I demonstrated. Um, for the resolution, we, we can get a best-in-class resolution up to 26-bit singleton. So this depends on the line count or on the teeth. In my case here, I'm running at 60 teeth, um, meaning I can add 16 bits uh, at least. So this allows me to easily do uh, 23 bits, what I did. Um, the accuracy um, is quite outstanding. The total INL of one revolution can be easily below 0 .0, 0 0.5 degrees. I reached 0 0.2 right now. And uh, what is also an interesting point, the system can run at a very low hysteresis. So this means also a systematic error if you power up an absolute device with a hysteresis, you have a systematic error. So it must, so it's an advantage to have a low hysteresis. Um, as Patrick already explained, we, we have a non-volatile multi-turn uh, engine with help of the external battery. So this consumes two up to 30 milliamps. It depends a little bit <coughs> on the speed and acceleration you, you teach. Um, the system I demonstrated here allows you to go up to 16,000 RPM as I'm having the 80 CPR input. If the input is lower, you, uh, the velocity uh, can be higher. <coughs> Using a gear wheel means that the axial play can be much higher. It's, uh, the radial target allows us to move in the, in the axial, uh, axial direction, not quite for the disc. The disc is a little bit limited. Um, the system plays at a total angle lag of just eight microseconds, and that is quite low. If you com compare it with the conventional hall sensors, you have sensors doing 10 microseconds, 20 microseconds, or some do a millisecond. Here, we have a very fast front end, taking approximately 6 point something. And on top, TW29 uh, adds some latency, which can be compensated by the internal digital engine. So in total, we get just 8 microseconds. Self-calibration for ease of commissioning, that's what I've demonstrated. And the complete system runs off 3.3 .3 volt over a broad temperature range. As we have the SPI interface always available, you can easily expand it by connecting an MCU to get uh, to implement an EDS data sheet, to get OEM memory, to implement user commands, or also to convert uh, the accurate position data back to analog outputs if you need to. Um, finally, also, if I have an absolute uh, front end, we could also consider to do a full programmable quadrature encoder. Of course, the costs are here higher, but I'd just like to mention that this is possible. Okay, so I'm done with my slides and uh, ready for questions and answers, if you like. Thank you, Joachim. Very interesting. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A session, we will also ask you to take another poll. So just take a minute to review these questions.
So thank you very much for taking the questions. So we'll just give you a short summary of the polling results. So as you can see here, uh, yes, uh, battery buffered multi-turn and single turn was the most frequently required answer. And then uh, battery buffered uh, multi-turn only. So yes, that's the answer for you, uh, Joachim. So just quickly now moving on to the to the questions and answer sessions. So I will just read out a question for you here, Joachim, which says, is it possible to use a sensor, TMR, which is currently being evaluated with TW29 to expand the PVS so that a battery buffered absolute measuring system is created. There is no way to use a magnet, question mark. Well, actually a GMR system uh, could be, um, uh, wait a second, you could use a GMR plus the, the T plus the PVS to get this uh, Whole counting that would be possible, but I think uh, it is in, time, in terms of cost, um, the GMR sensor would be replaced by by the uh, sine cosine sensors of the PVS. Okay. Good. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, Patrick, I have a couple of questions for you as well from from the early sessions. So just yes. we'll start with the first one here. Um, is a, a sine cosine calibration integrated or delivers uh, or does uh, is ICPVS deliver just raw output signals? Um, we have an internal analog calibration in ICPVS, so it's possible to remove offset and amplitude error. There is uh, not a phase correction uh, there. We decided this because usually the phase error you get with the ICPVS due to the design of the, the whole line is uh, pretty low. Thank you, Patrick. And back to you, Joachim. I have one question for you here. Can you explain the differences between a TW28 and TW29 in terms of applications? Yeah, okay, sure. Well, you could look at the TW29 as a drop-in replacement uh, to replace or to upgrade TW28. So uh, 28 runs at a lower accuracy and just 10-bit resolution, whereas the TW29 offers you at least 16 bits uh, and a much better res a much better accuracy, uh, and also the uh, BIS interface is not available on on the TW28, so those are the differences. Okay, thank you, Joachim. I have time for one last question now for for Patrick again. Um, it goes back to the earlier question: Is there an option for offset gain and phase correction? I think I answered that before. Um, yes, offset and um, amplitude error, so gain. Correction is in there, phase not. And just uh, let me also add, early on there was a question, what is the maximum period count that uh, PVS can track? And uh, unfortunately, I gave the wrong answer. So um, the right answer is it's a 16-bit that can be tracked. Okay, that concludes today's uh, session. The Q&As are done. And uh, before I move on to just thank you for participating, I just want to make sure that you are aware of our next webinar, which is going to be in May, and uh, just to give you a teaser for that one. And I and the team here, we just want to say thank you very much for attending, and uh, thanks for all the good questions, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, and please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.